We are living through a dizzying technological era, and at times it feels impossible to keep up with the advances in AI, communication, and surveillance that are shaping the ways in which we interact with our world and controlling the ways in which we perceive and receive information. On the front lines of these advances are often people in power, governments, police, intelligence agencies, and militaries trying to use new research to advance the ways in which they operate in a digital era. In the right hands, this technology can help protect societies, solve crimes, and maintain safety and security. But in the wrong hands, authoritarian systems can seek to manipulate the truth, silence critics, or expand colonial power. So, who watches The Watchmen? Welcome to The Big Picture, a show about the past, the present, and the future. My name is Mohammed Hassan, and today we speak with forensic investigator and architect Eyal Wiseman. Wiseman began his career in Israel, examining the ways in which mapping and satellite imagery could be used to isolate communities and entrench a system of military control. His first book, Hollow Lands, documented the Israeli government's use of urban planning to entrench the occupation of the West Bank. It was groundbreaking work, and work only an architect could have done. He founded a firm, Forensic Architecture, that brings together architects, journalists, artists, and coders with a mandate to investigate and solve crimes using open source collaborations, focusing in particular on challenging these sources of power and the structures that can often manipulate the truth. Pleasure to have you. Welcome to the big picture. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here as a Middle East Eye reader. Oh, that's, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there's a lot that I want to talk to you now that I have you here in this chair. Um, yeah. But I guess, you know, we can start with something basic. And I'm not an architect myself, but from my understanding of architecture is that among many things, it's the study of space and how space impacts people. And I wanted to ask you, as, as kind of a starting point, at, at what point in time during your study of architecture did you realize that that impact that can have on people could be helpful, but it could also be harmful? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, like in architectural education, we are, it's very technical education at its core, but it interested, it's a, it's a subject that is interested in society, in politics, and what we call the formative forces that organize space and buildings. Um, think of it as a force field, politics as a kind of a very wide and multivalented force field in which matter exists within and is kind of stretched and pulled in different directions. Those forces are economy, money mainly, um, you know, finance, the law, regulation, uh, culture, what people, how people want to live, etc. Um, but increasingly, and what interested me in it, is the desire that is actually existing within architecture. Very dark desire to control people. And sometimes an architect would design a flat, and it would be very benign. They would think, okay, I'm going to arrange this and that interaction within the living room or in a corridor, this and that kind of form of encounter within a building. Uh, but that, that um, desire, that kind of dark desire within architecture to control the people that enter into it can be augmented, amplified, and manipulated into systems of control. And this is why architecture is such a dangerous tool in the hands of authoritarian, colonial, uh, or any form of powers that seek to control and manage people's lives. And uh, it becomes a weapon that is extremely effective. And the minute that you open your eyes to it and you start understanding this is the kind of the dark side of architecture, you know, like the, the dark side of the architect's desire to influence the people that exist, that live, that use the buildings, um, 
you understand that something there is so fucked up that as an architect, you need to know how to oppose it. And you need to go into the very structure and assumptions of your own discipline in order to invert and use the power of architectural reading, of architectural understanding, against that architectural desire to control and manage and supervise the people that are within spaces. So this is why as a, you know, as a young architect, um, and I studied here in the UK, uh, I started to become very interested in the way in which um, you know, regimes of power uh, using space, walls, uh, doors, corridors, uh, checkpoints, and all sort of other instruments as uh, instruments of war, war against the people, and how, if architecture is an instrument of war, how it could also be subverted, how we as architects can find in it means of resistance to this inherent desire to, of control that exists within architecture. And as in somebody that grew up in Palestine uh, with the Jewish-Israeli heritage, having experienced that growing up, having lived and grown up in Haifa, uh, a city where a small uh, surviving Palestinian community remained, where the ethnic cleansing, the destruction of Palestinian life emptied Palestine of its villages and cities and, and Haifa, a small part of that remained. But you could see how architecture, how the roads, how the, the way in which buildings were actually channeling traffic, uh, how topography was used in order to contain that small community of survivors uh, that existed within Haifa. So any thought of architecture from that moment on was connected in my mind to this dark side of architecture. Architecture is a means of control. If you go to Haifa today, you would see the small Palestinian surviving community down in the valley, surrounded by infrastructures that do not let it expand, that kind of keep it bounded in space, whereas the mountain is occupied by Jewish Israelis. And in fact, Haifa, the architecture of Haifa, became the blueprint, and this is something I only later realized for the Israeli settler colonial project in Jalil, in the West Bank, uh, in uh, the Nakab, uh, etc. That um, the very early sort of 1920s sort of planning policy, still under the British mandate, very early years of the British mandate, where the Jewish um, uh, Yeshuv, the, sort of the Zionist uh, uh, proto-Israelis, or those that, that grew up to uh, evolve to become the, sort of the Israeli society, wanted to separate and contain the Palestinian using architectural means uh, and using the mountains for that. And this is something, the blueprint of Haifa you can see anywhere. If you drive through the West Bank, you see the Jewish communities on a hilltop, you see still the Palestinian villages contained, surrounded by all spectrum of architectural um, vocabulary, you know, you the kind of the roads, the walls, um, planning policy that kind of takes away uh, their capacity to connect to other villages and, and just the desire to contain and supervise uh, that exists within this sort of uh, uh, DNA of separation that uh, already has been experimented uh, in, in Haifa. As, as I said, this is the city I grew up in. Um, and you could say that, you know, I, something about me is always attracted to kind of like understanding the dark side of systems. So that is uh, really was my starting point. When it comes to to the the, the, the settlements and the blueprints of the settlements, which, you know, your, your book Holland was was, was focused on. Yeah. Um, one of the, 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 the things that you first realize as, as a visitor to the West Bank is this very specific network of settlements and checkpoints and yeah. roads and yeah. how all these three kind of cross uh, section, they created a cross section of, of the yeah. entire West Bank that is very much controlled by, by Israel's army. Yeah. 
what were you seeing as an architect through your lens that to an international community Israel calls necessary security measures? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that um, the project that um, maybe one of the projects that started me up um, after a period of volunteering for the uh, Palestinian Authority Ministry of Planning, um, realizing the lack of maps that Israel Israel did not provide at the time, aerial images and up-to-date maps, uh, although they provided a scattered bits of territory surrounded uh, during uh, the Oslo Accord. Um, when I graduated, I started to work on a project whose ambition was to actually see if we can indict an architect, an Israeli architect, building in a settlement in war crimes. Could you imagine war crimes to be committed on the drawing board in a way that an architect draw lines and you know roads and says where people are and where parks are and where uh, homes will be built. Could there be a way of drawing those lines that could violate international humanitarian law, that is the law of war, violate human rights, participate in a settler colonial project uh, in that respect? So I was very, very focused not only on the fact that Israeli architects were building in occupied territory, which is which was the form of critique that existed of the settlements, right? The violation of the Geneva Convention by which you're not allowed to build in occupied territory and to transfer your own population into an occupied territory. I was interested in the next step, how they build. And here you enter into the minutia, minutia of the profession. And here is where architectural perspective become the only way in which you can understand it because as an architect, I could understand architectural plans and I could understand the way in which uh, the layout of a colony was stretched artificially long and thin so that it creates a wedge like a knife that cuts roads uh, that would otherwise connect a very intricate Palestinian regional economy, the relation between villages and towns, etc. Bah! cut in that way. So that bit of architecture was not designed in, even in order to serve the colonists who were living there. It was designed in order to generate material harm to the Palestinians in that area, right? So an architect uses their skill to generate material harm. Uh, a crime has been committed. And that was my desire to actually say, until now, we were thinking about those people that violate international humanitarian law, human rights, etc., as politicians, as military personnel, as police officers, etc. Let's look at architects uh, and how, how they might be uh, involved in this very brutal uh, project. And in order to do that, I've, you know, I've collected uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of blueprints of uh, settlements and composed them together into a map and actually started to understand that territory as a kind of a battlefield in which houses were like tanks used on a battlefield. And in fact, many of the architects of the Israeli colonial project were actually former generals or maybe not generals, but officers in the military. So they knew how to use your unit in order to envelope and to enter and surround and bisect because these are terminologies and kind of um, practices that, that military personnel are kind of engaged in. And you would see that undertaken on a drawing board and in a kind of slow motion war in which uh, a war of streets and homes, a war in which... Um, the, the territory slowly hardens into a kind of a, a system, a matrix of control in a prison uh, that would empty that area, would end, aim to, of course, Palestinian resistance exists and, and, and forms of life are maintained within that, but aims to empty it out of its life. And you say in Holland as well that, you, that you know, the, 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 the Palestinians that you were working with were, we're telling you very explicitly that 
there are all of these blueprints that they don't have access to, but that you, um, as an as an Israeli, as a Jewish person, have access to, and that allowed them to see the reality around them that because they didn't have these maps or these blueprints that they were kind of blind to what was hap- what was going on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a very famous piece by Edward Said. Um, I think 2000, 2001 in December. Has written a piece about cartography and counter cartography. And he actually called for a cartographic shift. He said, you know, we need to start mapping out the way in which colonialism operates, and we need to invert the way our relationship to maps, because no one uh, can, can uh, understood better than Said how maps are the instruments of the dominator, how maps are a product of imperialism and colonialism. Uh, enabled co- imperialism and colonialism. Uh, but he claimed map could be inverted. It could be a counter-cartography, a cartography of resistance. And it's, it's a huge spectrum in his writing between the kind of cartography of daily life, of roots of the invisible, and the exposure of the logic of control to which um, Palestinian, in that case, and other colonized people in different cases, uh, are subjected to um, a way of understanding, so it could be, so it could be opposed. Counter cartography is the exposure of of cartographic or geographic realities that, in the sort of in the neo colonial kind of era that we are now, are trying to cover their traces. You know, the kind of the logic, maybe it's sort of imperialism and colonialism, colonialism of old was very proud to advertise its achievements, right? Even the kind of the ethnic cleansing, genocides, the building on uh, in, you know, in places like Australia, in Tasmania, in, our, in our places like that. Uh, today, you know, the international reality require that crimes do not advertise themselves in that form. You need to kind of, um, you know, put a veneer of um, of legitimacy on your project, uh, and um, and this is why Israel was kind of like hiding those blueprints, uh, definitely hiding them from Palestinians. So I was working like a, you know, kind of small scale industrial spy, you know, like going to cadastral offices, photocopying things, bringing it to Ramallah, etc. And then at some point, and this is something that shocked us all, you know, we, we, we worked, uh, it was, you know, wide collaboration on this map. Uh, it was published in 2002 in the most brutal and painful years of the second intifada of the, you know, and Palestinian. It's, a, you know, a month after the destruction of Janine and Nablus. Um, and... And then a few years later, maybe three years later, cartography disappeared. Disappeared as a practice. Mm. Satellite images became widely available. Nobody was drawing maps like we used to. You know, it was maybe the last kind of cartographic project. And then I understood that counter cartography has to turn into counter forensics, i.e. we need to enter the space of the image. We need to enter the videos that are found online. We need to understand how to read satellite images and how to shed lights, expose the crimes of the occupiers. And you, you, there's something that, that, that you've said before that I think kind of resonates with, with what you're saying now is that the idea that politics has entered into the realm of aesthetics yeah. and, that, um, and that in order to, to be able to counter the politics, you need to also own the space of aesthetics. Could, yeah. could, could you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is more recent thought that is um, that, that is connected to our work in uh, forensic architecture. You know, so very often people come to us and say, when we submit a report and it goes to court and the lawyers on the other side are pouncing on the fact that, you know, some people on the kind of expert list, you know, there's always a kind of a list of authors to every report, um, you know, have their trainings in filmmaking or in, or in art or something like that. And they go like, how come, you know, this is not serious. 
this is uh, or you know sometimes we show our work in in art and cultural spaces or um, and we say that in a time where videos and photographs are the most effective and common bits of evidence for war crimes uh, it is um, uh, the kind of the practitioners of the image photographers and filmmakers whose uh, opinion we would seek and when the war enters the city uh, it is architects that, um, that that would have a voice and where violence becomes digital um, it is coders that are now going to so we work to invert the entire field of visibility and expertise around crime so it's not only the kind of the the DNA scientists and the uh, sort of uh, ballistic experts uh, that, that are there, but actually people that work and can understand images, can understand buildings, can understand code um, that are entering and completely transforming uh, the field of evidence and the field of agency within those fields. Because, you know, when you were an artist or an architect, you know, you could, you know, you, you could protest against some things. But now we realize that actually what we have on our laptops, those packs of software, editing software, design software, uh, 3D animation can become extremely powerful tools that can actually cause some serious problems to governments if they are used correctly. And to be used correctly is not only to be used as evidence in courts, but to be mobilized um, politically beyond that court, because every case is about a political relation that and a political reality, whether we work in Palestine or as we now as a, a big sort of um, forensic agency work all over the world with offices in, in Mexico and in Bogota and in Brazil and in, uh, now in Greece and in Turkey and in other places. Uh, when we work on in these places, we understand that every incident, every shooting incident, let's say, with police murder or anything like that, exists within a particular political constellation that incident is a doorway when you go into the molecular level and start analyzing it using videos and and uh, images and spatial reconstruction you start understanding what's happening there you have like a bundle of threads and then you pull the threads and you can actually locate it and tie it back to the world in which it is part and actually navigate outwards and understand the context of that incident. It's not only about the incident. The incident is a doorway to understand wider political relations. We also identified and reconstructed the precise position of the Israeli forces three minutes before the shooting. The convoy consisted of five bulletproofed armored vehicles. The front and back vehicles are positioned sideways so that its shooting hole here is directed towards the street. According to the model, this is what the marksmen would have seen when they began shooting. The journalists' press vests would have been clearly visible here and throughout the incident. This is somewhat of a provocative question. Yeah. Um, when you take a look at the work that, that you do, the forensic architecture does, yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, it's hugely impressive. And as as a layman, I mean, the only thing that I could, the thing that I immediately connected to was, is, you know, it's like you're watching CSI, or it's like you're watching the the the, the kind of the cutting edge of of the the TV detective work that we're yeah. that we kind of grew up watching. So, with the kind of tools and the expertise that you have, why not work with police? Why not work with these establishments? Um, if you are essentially doing the same thing or using the same tools, what is the idea behind very specifically saying that we're going to work at holding these structures to power instead? Yeah. So firstly, I, I, um, uh, I very much like this question, but I don't agree that we use the same techniques. I think that we have um, fell upon, then experimented with, new techniques, new epistemologies, new ways of providing knowledge and, and shedding lights uh, through open source uh, investigation to modeling and animation and, and you know, using code to expose uh, acts of digital violence. 
so I don't think, I think that uh, we like to think of our practice as counter forensics, meaning that this is forensics against the state. Uh, the state has its means. Forensics is just like architect. Forensic, you know, both words that compose the the name of our practice, forensic architecture, are so contaminated in different ways. So I told you what I thought about architecture. Yeah. And I'll tell you, you now what forensics. I think about forensics. <laughs> no, forensics is the act of state to control and survey population. Its history is the history of colonialism. It's the history of control of what the state called deviance. It's the history of control of revolutionaries. It's about, you know, taking the fingerprint, creating an archive so we know where you are, so that when we need to get you, we'll know where to get you. So forensics and architecture have such dark side. You put them together and something else happened. No, you take minus and minus and maybe plus um, comes together because Putting together architecture and forensics is beyond the sum of its part. It kind of allows practitioners in architecture, art, civil society activists, um, coders, to actually mobilize their tools to hold state to account. And when I say it's not the same practice, it's because it cannot be the same practice, because when states come to investigate the murder scene. The first thing that comes up is a cordon. The cordon cuts that space out from the rest of, you know, the street or the city. It becomes a site of exception. It becomes a, a site of the state. And it removes uh, public access completely. Completely remove public access. Now, if you are the perpetrator and you can do that, it's the best way uh, to do cover-ups. We cannot do that. And by the fact that we cannot do that, that we cannot isolate or insulate the site, means that we, we can work only with what leaks, only with what is kind of like something, you know, the, the borders of the cordon have to become porous. Something has to go under them. Either somebody leaks something or somebody is recorded or somebody saw and remembers or we can see using, you know, Later on or from above, we can see some traces of things and then we need to amplify them. If you have all the data, you don't need that level of creativity and you don't need to mobilize aesthetics in order to gear up small, what we call faint traces into become politically effective. And, uh, and therefore, you know, this state of inherent inferiority in access to data requires an amplified creativity uh, or design intelligence, if you like, architectural intelligence, aesthetic intelligence, in order to find that, that, you know, this kind of small trace that can, with it you can deconstruct the state narrative uh, of it. And state have, states have enough of um, mechanisms to hold us, uh, you know, under control and uh, et cetera, as, as they want us to be. Um, but coming from and having grown up in an environment in which a state is, is, is a bad state, it's a colonizing state, uh, you cannot rely on its police. The police is part of its perpetrating mechanism. Uh, the legal system is there to dispossess. Um, you need to find an alternative form of forensic practice one that is not necessarily geared toward court. So, you know, let's say a, a good quarter or third of our cases do reach court. And, you know, when they reach court, they become decisive in it. And, you know, we've been part of major cases internationally and that led to convention. You know, in Greece, we uh, our, our analysis was presented in a case that banned the Nazi party there, the Golden Dawn, uh, and convicted its perpetrators. Uh, and, and in many other places, in, in Colombia, in many other places, uh, we had um, uh, sort of like decisive evidence presented. But our forensics goes beyond the court. It's not part, it's not, we do not surrender to the bureaucratical logic of the court system. We find other fora uh, to present our work. Sometimes it's in the media, sometimes it's in exhibitions, sometimes it's in 
citizen tribunals or the truth commissions, etc. Um, and sometimes it's all of the above. We would take the same piece of evidence and we would kind of offset the limitation that exists in each forum by presenting it uh, in others. Uh, because precisely because it's more than a legal practice, it's a political one. And politics needs the visibility. Mm. You know, we the need aesthetics. To the aesthetics. Aesthetics as as putting it in front of the ears and eyes of, of a public uh, in order to render uh, their judgment rather than simply cater for a particular judge or jury in a, in a, in a situation. The idea of um, openness versus exclusivity yeah. is kind of the ethos behind open source investigations, totally. right? Could, 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 could you kind of explain what open source investigations are and how it relates to your practice? Yeah, yeah. So imagine that that we were thinking before open source that um, in order to expose something, let's say you're, inv- you're an investigative journalist. No, I mean, at least I has, has had some very important stories. Uh, usually journalistic practice is about having a source, right? You have a source inside. That source gives you a tip or tells you a story. Uh, you protect the name of the source and you'd come up, you'd expose that. You know, some of the biggest stories... Um, were, um, you know, exposed uh, in that way. You know, I mean, you think about the heroes of investigative journalism from Watergate to, um, you know, the massacres in Vietnam, etc. Uh, this is this is how they are. Uh, open source is saying, no, we do not rely and we do not trust the kind of those secret sources from inside. Um, there is enough floatsome out there in the public domain that exist, but we don't see. So oh, we can, we, we, we look, but we don't see, right? Uh, online, there is so many traces of so many things that have happened. Uh, if, but each one of those traces is partial. I'll give you an example. The biggest ever success of open source investigators has been in exposing one of the biggest programs of the CIA, the Extraordinary Rendition, right? You know, easily the most secret uh, kind of policy that that the CIA was involved at the time that involved kidnapping people from places, say Pakistan, Afghanistan, Somalia, and other places, sending them to to a third country or fourth country uh, to be tortured um, and, um, and then, you know, they disappear into some um, prison, either in those countries or, or elsewhere. Um, those traces, those those stories left little traces. You know, airplanes had to be uh, hired, uh, and they exist on on kind of like um, open source. Um, you know, flight trackers. Uh, perhaps they're landing, and somebody takes a picture, post online. Uh, there are different places within cities and warehouses. Um, the some people that were tortured and detained in that way uh, later upon interviews were remembering the labels of the water bottles that they were um, offered in different places, and you can start constructing a geography. Ah, a Polish bottle of uh, of mineral water. Uh, a flight that is later flying to, you know, to Morocco or Lithuania, etc. You know, an entire network is exposed. Every sec- secret act exists within the world. Everything that exists within the world appears on a radar as something. And those fragments need to be connected. So us in the open source community are kind of uh, just connecting dots of partial evidence. So let's say, you know, like the kind of trophy videos that you see often in um, circulating uh, virally online, you know, police officers shoot somebody, you have perpetrator and victim in the same frame, uh, that does not maybe need an open source investigate, but for every one like that, you'd have thousands of cases in which videos exist before and after, uh, maybe just the sound of the incident, um, maybe one dimension of it, and you need to start composing. And that act of composition has an architecture to it. And this is why architecture has been at the heart of the open source revolution. The understanding that composition 
of part evidence needs a 3D model or a map in which the relation in space and time of that video showing an airplane leaving the scene and this video showing an ambulance and a, a fourth video you know, showing somebody saying something, another one showing somebody shouting, somebody's running in the street, you need to know what's the relation between those things. You put them, you build a 3D model. Sometimes we need those 3D models that we build. We synchronize and locate hundreds of images. And the story is in a composition, how they come together. So architecture is the heart, is at the heart of the open source revolution. And uh, we were very early on uh, working with groups like Bellingcat and, and others uh, on cases. And I think everybody understood that in order to actually build a case, you need architectural models. Uh, we developed that skill. Later, we shared it with uh, small human rights groups, or large human rights groups like Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, but later worked with the New York Times to build their own visual investigation unit around architectural modeling. And boom, and then it's kind of like you see it everywhere. But the understanding is, and what one needs to understand, that there is no open source investigation without architecture at its heart. Architecture is the medium that synchronizes and brings these things mm. together. When it comes to um, what you were saying earlier about the the access that, that, say, the Israeli government had to maps and, and to mapping before there were satellites, and you look at the, the way that technology advances in the hands of the public versus in the hands of military and, and police institutions, when it comes to challenging... Um, an institution like the IDF, when it comes to challenging the U.S. police system or um, the, uh, the the states that were using NSO um, hacking equipment, yeah. uh, states that are that are investing enormous amounts of money to be at the absolute cutting edge of technology, yeah. do you feel like it's constantly an uphill battle to try and bridge that gap, or or is that gap closer than these institutions would like to believe? Yeah, I, I, I believe it's like you can never rest. Uh, you can never develop a technique and just repeat it. And in fact, in forensic architecture, we never take the same case twice. So we never do cases that we know in advance how to do. And also, what is the what is the, the answer? Uh, we take cases only in order to develop new techniques and technologies because, indeed, the minute that you have done something and you've put it on the public domain, uh, the militaries would learn from you. In fact, it, it, is, it is a field in which now you see also the occupation having units that are um, dealing with social media and sometimes synchronizing and building models with that. You know, in a very rudimentary form, I, I'm, I'm content that in every time that would meet them, that would, would have an opportunity not to meet them or work with them, but to confront them, uh, with the strengths of our evidence that we would prevail uh, because I believe that just simply, you know, our our team and networks of collaborations are, are much more, you know, much smarter uh, than, um, than, than those in the propaganda or Hasbara or spokesperson's uh, office in, in, uh, of the uh, occupation ar army or other... Uh, police, um, but you need to you need to keep on evolving. You need to keep on evolving, otherwise you ossify, and otherwise they'll just, you know, you'll be appropriated. Your techniques will be appropriated by power, and that's always the danger. It's always there because we share, you know, we share a single world, and the minute something is out, it could be seen You're by giving anyone. away your secrets. Yeah. My final question to you uh, is: taking a look, you know, right now. Everybody's talking about this predicted next leap in technology with machine learning, with AI tools, yeah. with all of these things that are suddenly people are, are freaking out about, but they're also yeah. fascinated by. Yeah. In the work that you do as an investigator, where yeah. do you see the future of this? And is this something that is going to put power in the hands of citizens or increasingly in the hands of power structures? It depends on us. 
It simply depends on us. If we are going to struggle, if we're not going to take anything for granted that technology is going to save us from power, technology is just a tool. It has the repressive, you remember how we spoke about architecture, it has this dark side and it has a capacity to resist it. And such is technology, such is satellite images and videos and uh, machine learning and all those things have the possibility inherent in them for subversion. Uh, architecture could be an instrument of freedom and it could be an instrument of repression. Uh, and if you feel that this is pre-given, you've given up on a fight, we're lost. And you need to struggle every day in order to find those loopholes in technologies that could turn them into um, tools of freedom. The fight continues. Yeah, yeah. Eyal hey, Wiseman, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for I being here with it. us today. Yeah, thank you, Hassan. It was great. Thank you for watching, and thank you to E.L. Wiseman for this fascinating and philosophical conversation. Please do check out Forensic Architecture and the fascinating and incredible work that they have done over the last couple of years. And if you enjoyed this conversation, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. And we'll see you next time.